Great. Thank you all. Thank you. You can do your mantle for us. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, when I graduated from college in a hall like this, I don't remember much about it except for the Reverend Peter Gomes, you may have known, yes. gave, a lecture call, gave a sermon called What We Forgot to Tell You. And what he said was that people had come up before the thing, and he had said, what do you want to do now that you're leaving college? This is where the students in the room. And most of them, given the college I was at, said, well, I want to be powerful. I want to be important. I want to be Secretary of State. And the Reverend Gomes said, aim higher. <laughs> By that, he meant not to be whatever. It meant, he said, be good. This college has turned out a lot of powerful people, a lot of influential people, even some secretaries of state. We don't turn out enough good people. I want to say that Madeleine Albright fits into the category, which is a small overlapping category of people who have been really influential, have deep values, but also is a good and kind person. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's, um, she needs no introduction, but I once had dealt with a predecessor of yours, Henry Kissinger, and the person <laughs> said, he's a man who needs no introduction, and just left, and Dr. Kissinger said, well, there may be people who don't need an introduction, but I'm somebody who sure enjoys one. <laughs> so I'm going no, no. to say that she's the 64th Secretary of State of the United States, was the UN ambassador for the United States before that, has written five best-selling books, including this one, which is for sale outside. And for those of you who come up and say, do you think she'd mind signing the book? You don't get what a book tour is. This is what you're supposed yeah, to do. Is is get the book and have her sign it, so we'll be staying afterwards. She also did a great book called Madam Secretary and the one on uh, religion. The, the Mighty and the, the Mighty and the Almighty. They are books that talk about our values and our foreign policy. She's also been a professor and a friend of the Aspen Institute where I work. So thank you very much for coming, Secretary Albright. Well, Walter, it's great to be here and with all of you. And thank you for telling everybody who I am, uh, <laughs> because sometimes people don't know. Not long ago, I was coming back from China, and Chicago was the first port of entry. And I was there getting undressed for the security people. And <laughs> I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt, and the lady behind me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? My bottles all leak. And I said, well, I got them at the container store. And then I'm going through the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looks at me, and he says, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> uh, he said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia. And if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia. And you're always welcome in Bosnia. Uh, and so then he says, can we do it? I have a picture. And I said, sure. And it screws up the whole line. And then I go back and get my stuff, and the lady of the screw top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, I will add a codicil to that, correct me if I'm wrong, or actually don't correct me if I'm wrong, which is that a large percentage of girls born the following year were named Madeline yes, yes, because of yes, you and yes, Bosnia. That is true. That, um, but let me just say how pleased I am to be here and to be here with you, Walter, because um, we have been friends a long time, and you have been, I think, clearly one of the most distinguished journalists and also a great biographer and somebody that has explored all kinds of subjects in, in your books. You did an incredible job as president of the Aspen Institute, and I'm very proud to be with you at this wonderful university with Welcome all back of you. to Tulane, so yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a biographer, I have to start biographically, because you've written a book called Fascism, A Warning, and you obviously started writing it before our recent election, so it wasn't aimed at that, but it was aimed at your knowledge throughout your own life of how fascists rise. So let me start biographically with just, I'll say, 1939, March. Well, 
what happened was I was actually born two years earlier in 1937 in Prague, Czechoslovakia. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, uh, the, kind of the first generation of those people, and he uh, had been a press attaché in Belgrade, but was in Prague when the Nazis marched in in March 1939. And my whole life has been determined by uh, what America's role has been, and I can kind of trace everything. And for a Czechoslovak, the major uh, watershed event was Munich. And Munich happened in September 1938, and uh, the British and French made an agreement with the Germans and Italians, and the U.S. was not there, and the country was sold down the river to uh, the Germans and to the Nazis. And then in March, they did come in. My father managed to, and uh, my mother and I, to escape, and he went to join the Czechoslovak government in exile in London. So I spent the war in London all through the Blitz, um, and then the Americans came. And again, that made such a difference that the Americans and the Yankees and everybody, it was all there and fantastic. Then the war ended and we went back to Czechoslovakia, but uh, again, General Patton was supposed to liberate Czechoslovakia, but there had been an, uh, an agreement made between the US and the Soviet Union that the Red Army would liberate Czechoslovakia. My father was sent to be the Czechoslovak ambassador in Yugoslavia. So the little girl in the national costume that gives flowers at the airport, <laughs> that's what I did for a living. Uh, uh, and my father, as a professional diplomat, his time was up after three years, and so he got a new assignment, and that was to represent Czechoslovakia on a new commission to do with India and Pakistan over Kashmir. Mm. And he was very interested to do that. And then there was a coup in Czechoslovakia, February 1948, and the communists took over. He did so not want to work. So in 1948, work. you're now hitting two forms of fascism, having escaped the Nazis, exactly. and now the communists right. have taken over. And so um, he didn't want to work for the communists, and he, his best friends in Belgrade were the British and American ambassadors, and they said, well, why don't you work with us, which he did. We came to the United States. Uh, I, my mother's brother and sister and I came on the SS America November 11th, 1948. And my father came a little bit later. And when he came, he defected. And he begged for a political asylum. And, um, uh, and I have a copy of the letter that he wrote, literally begging for a political asylum which he got. And so for me, coming to America and having escaped, as you point out, twice, basically, um, um, fascists, because communists are fascists also, um, in terms of uh, leaving your country. And then the thing I will never forget, my father used to say regularly, when we were in England, people were very kind to us. And that he said, they would say, we're so sorry your country's been taken over by a terrible dictator. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you? And when are you going home? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we came to the United States, people would say, we're so sorry. Your country's been taken over by a terrible system. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you? And when will you become a citizen? And my father said, that is what made America different from every other country. Yeah. So that must make the current immigration and asylum disputes now very personal for you. Very much so. I think that um, I watch it and I, th and I can't, it's un-American. That's the only thing I can say of separating children from their parents. Um, um, I, um, I do think that every country has a right to make its immigration laws. That is a sovereign right. And I think the U.S. on the whole has been generous. I think we've gone through various periods of this. I think we need to have comprehensive immigration policy that really deals with the rule of law and admitting people and a generosity. I have traveled across the United States an awful lot throughout. It's a very big country and we have plenty of room. <laughs> um, the other thing is that I, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to give people their naturalization certificate. So the first time I did that was July 4th, 2000 at Monticello, Jefferson's home. I figured since I had his job, I could do that. Um, <laughs> and so um, I would give people their certificate, and all of a sudden I heard this man saying, can you believe it, I'm a refugee 
and I just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. So I went up to him and I said, can you believe that a refugee is Secretary of State? And that is what America is about. <laughs> right, right. Um, Why did we in the United States, and frankly, throughout the Western world, whether it's Hungary, the Czech Republic now, even England, lose that pointing true north of the moral compass that we accept people like that? Well, I, th I think it's a genuine question, but in the, you said rightfully that I was beginning to write this book before um, whatever that happened in the elections. And as somebody who has been um, really concerned about uh, politics, domestic and international relations, I was seeing something that troubled me a great deal, which are great divisions in American society. Um, when we came to the United States, there really was kind of the sense that it was a middle-class country, and I found it very hard to believe that there was great poverty in the United States and that there was anger and a, an issue about what had happened in terms of the, the negative side of technology and just kind of a sense of disquiet. Um, and what troubled me was that uh, I was trying to figure out what happened, and this wasn't just in the United States, in many places, in terms of some as a result of the financial crisis. Um, and then what I was seeing in other countries was the rise of people that, in fact, exacerbated those differences rather than trying to figure out how to find um, common ground. So that's why I started looking at it. And I decided that the book needed to be historic to find out um, what fascism was about. And the thing that bothers me is people throw the term fascist around without really thinking about it. Anybody you disagree with is a fascist. Uh, and then the teenage boy who's not allowed to drive thinks his father's a fascist. <laughs> and so the main thing is that fascism is not an ideology. It is a process for uh, getting and taking power. And so uh, defining it is not easy. And the way I define it, because it comes out of that anger and uh, disquiet of division is a leader who identifies himself with a group of some kind, usually a nationalist group of some, that then um, is opposed to a smaller group of people, and the smaller group of people are to blame for the problems, the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is one part. And then it's a, a leader that not only exacerbates that difference, but has absolutely no respect for the press, the media is, a free press is the basis of democracy. Um, um, and then also doesn't understand the, the, the system and the importance of the judiciary and independent judiciary, thinks that he's above the law. And so ultimately, the thing in defining the fascist process, I think it, it is defined by using violence to get power uh, to retain power. That One of the things you do in the book, and I think you do in your class at Georgetown, because you say in the book, is answer these questions. Yeah. You know, is the person trying to divide us? Is the person playing on hate? Is the person, you know, yeah, absolutely. suppressing a free right. press? And, and, but I think what is interesting, I went back and did a lot of research on Mussolini, because he was the first fascist. And the term comes from these uh, golden rods, fasces, and then the, their emblem also has an ax on it, and so the word fascist came that way. And Mussolini was somebody that was an outsider. He had come from a poor family. He was not treated well in school. He initially, he began as a, as a lefty, a communist, and then decided that the right wing worked more. The part that I found interesting was that he, and Italy was in a, uh, a great sense, Italy had fought on the side of the Allies during World War I, mm -hmm. but had not been recognized for what it had done. A lot of people died. There was an anger in the Italian population about what had happened to them. And uh, Mussolini plugged into that and kind of had some answers for uh, the anger. Um, I had a quote there when he said to a reporter, um, I am uh, sometimes, uh, I'm always right, I've never been wrong. Um, so, the, but the thing that, the best quote in the whole book comes from Mussolini, who said, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. And so I think there's a lot of feather plucking going on, 
By the way, you can't say those two words together too quickly. Uh, yeah. so, um, but, so I wanted to point out uh, uh, the, the feathers that are being plucked. And so Mussolini, what happens is he actually got power constitutionally because the King Emmanuel was weak and he needed a strong leader, and so he chose uh, Mussolini. Hitler, also Germany, was very dissatisfied with the Versailles Treaty and the reparations that had to be paid and the financial crisis and the weakness of the Weimar Republic. And Hitler was also able to identify himself with a group and uh, scapegoats. And what happened was he also came into power constitutionally when President von Hindenburg named him. And so well, I found interesting the constitutional aspect of that. And then the countries that I studied that are modern now, everybody has had an election. All the leaders that I talk about that are authoritarian, dictatorial were elected. And I think that is something that we need to understand. And the book, which you know, is just magnificent because it's both history and modern values, starts, as you say, with Mussolini and goes step by step. So let's keep that process going. I think you do Erdogan in Turkey yeah. and even North Korea, which is a bit of an exception. Yeah. Well, the thing that I've, uh, I have been very interested, obviously, in what happened in Central and Eastern Europe after the fall of the wall. And the country that is the worst example of what happened is Hungary. Right. Um, and what is interesting, that is a country that also was dissatisfied. Um, they, after World War I, they had been the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They lost a lot of land that was put into other independent countries. And I was doing a whole survey um, of all of Europe after um, the fall of the wall in 91. And I don't remember all the statistics, but one question that we had was, do you think a piece of your country is in the neighboring country? 80% Hungarians thought so. Now, I met Viktor Orban in the 80s, and he was a uh, really rambunctious dissident, somebody to really be admired. Um, we liked him. I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and at that stage, we brought him to the United States a number of times and very much opposed to communism. Um, by the way, his education was paid for by George Soros, um, whom he now uh, castigates and blames for everything. Um, but what happened was Orban worked off of this anger uh, and the fact that the communists had uh, ultimately made mistakes, um, and he rose to power, but he has been elected. Um, and he works off of this anger that a lot of Hungarians um, or people of Hungarian origin, um, in fact, live in the neighboring countries. So he is one of the great disappointments. The other one is what's happened in Poland. Poland, they had revolts every 10 years, um, and Lech Wałęsa and the solidarity, and yet some of the things that are going on there are very undemocratic and um, really disrespecting the judiciary, the Hungarians the same thing, so much that the European Union has begun to look at what one does about it. So that is very disappointing in kinds of what is going on. Now Turkey, you mentioned Erdogan. Um, I had spent a lot of time on Turkey and found it interesting and a lot about it is complicated. Uh, my youngest granddaughter, when we went there, uh, and a couple of years ago, or more five years ago now, said, I understand Turkey completely. Uh, we spent the night in Europe and had lunch in Asia. That yeah. does, in fact, describe Turkey pretty well. Um, and I think for those of you that have been to Istanbul, which I think is a glorious city, um, in many ways, Turkey had been run by the military or by the elitists who live on the other side of the Bosporus in big houses. And, um, and I think the people felt that they had been neglected. And Erdogan was somebody that had been a mayor. He went out into the countryside and really worked in the rural areas. He got elected, and then he got reelected because he did constituency services. So that kind of thing. And I can go through a number of other places, but they basically, people were elected. Duterte in the Philippines has been elected. Um, and there are these, um, and uh, as I said, I think the communists are fascist, but the bottom line, they're the only ones that had a revolution, the Russian Revolution and later the Chinese. You, you put Venezuela in that category? Yes, and well, Venezuela, had they had an election. And Hugo Chavez, by the way, when um, I went there, the 
excuse me, the first time when I was at the UN and uh, in Caracas, and the country was run by a bunch of tired old men that had no relationship to the indigenous peoples uh, of Venezuela. And then when Chavez uh, came to power and he, there had been a coup, I could see why he was attractive to people because he started talking about the indigenous peoples. He was gonna take the money from their oil profits and create a poor people's fund. He came to New York, President Clinton and I met him. We thought he was very charismatic. He went back and uh, all of a sudden the, his power went to his head and he thought he was Bolivar or something, but he had been elected. Um, but I have put Venezuela in that category. I, there are weird titles for, um, uh, Victor Orban calls his process illiberal democracy, which is kind of a weird mm -hmm. terminology. Yeah. Um, and the only uh, country that I decided really is run by a fascist leader, by the way, not every, um, uh, every fascist is an authoritarian dictator, not every authoritarian dictator is a fascist. But in North Korea, the family fascism through the Kim family um, has really been total control. There is uh, violence. Uh, Kim Jong-il has killed um, some relatives and people that are opposed to him. He's put people into labor camps. He has starved people, and he really does have total control. But I think what I've tried to do is to analyze what level things are, what are the elements of it, and what the threats are. Some people think my book is alarming. It is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, it is a warning, and, and that's why... And do I, you see things like that welling up here in the United States? Well, I'm troubled by some of the things that are going on in the United States. The division um, that uh, I see, and the fact that there is um, a, a real action, I think, from the highest level of exacerbating the differences, instead of trying to find that common ground. Um, and a lot of what happened in the election, I think, was exacerbating those differences and not trying to figure out how to solve them. And Walter, we talked a lot about this at Aspen, you and I, in terms of the fact that the social contract is broken. Um, and that is part of what's been going on. The social contract, um, going back in political philosophy, people gave up their individual rights in order to be protected by the state. And the state had certain responsibilities of not just protection, but building roads and things. And the people had a duty to um, not just vote, um, but it really is a privilege and a responsibility and understanding what was going on. And I think both sides of the contract have been broken mm -hmm. in terms of how society should be run, what one does about inequality, and trying to find some common answers rather than exacerbating the problem. Yeah, I mean, you and I and sort of the Aspen elite kind of missed it in a way when we thought globalization and trade yeah. and immigration was all wonderful. And there were people being left out of this. Um, let's start. One of the things, Walter, I've been saying is there are two mega trends and their downside. So most of the people um, are, that we know have benefited from globalization in some form or another. <clears throat> but what happens is that uh, it's faceless and people want to know what their identity is, which is fine in religious, ethnic, linguistic. That's um, uh, something that we all want. It's patriotic in some ways. But if my identity hates your identity, it's dangerous. And nationalism and hypernationalism are very dangerous. So you've got the globalizers versus the hyper-nationalists. Then there's technology, which I think has uh, been a huge benefit in every way. You've done a lot of writing about it and, and all the aspects that are important. And I always like to talk about the Kenyan woman farmer uh, who no longer has to walk miles to pay her bills. She can do it with her mobile phone, and it means she can have a life um, with her family or go get an education or start a business. The downside of it is, is that it has completely disaggregated people's voices, and people get their information through an echo chamber. Uh, they don't really know where they're getting their information, and it's very hard to create uh, political parties and have some kind of organized way of dealing with the problems that are really there on the economic equality, on what technology has done to jobs, and we did miss it. I think you're absolutely right. We missed it. One of the things you talk about among each of the strongmen, I won't say fascists, 
but strong men who try to come to power, is that they demonize the press and try to delegitimize it. Um, are you worried about that happening here? I'm very worried about it. I think that, uh, first of all, I, I do think, I do have the highest admiration for the press. I really, I spend a lot of my academic life studying the role of journalism and political change and what a difference it makes when there is a free press, and it truly is the basis of democracy. But I am very worried about um, the social media echo chamber aspect of it, um, and very concerned about the hype that has come in, um, where, um, and I hate to say this, is that to some extent um, there is kind of an addiction to uh, the crazier the news and then repeating it over and over again and hyping. And so even, uh, I mean, uh, I, I have said that one of the important things that has to happen, we have to mm -hmm. listen to people we disagree with. Um, and try to have respect for what they think and not just kind of put up with it, but listen. You should all be very glad you don't live in Washington because I listen to right-wing radio um, as I drive and there are a lot of hand gestures and <laughs> screaming. Um, but I listen to it and I, um, but I, I did something that I was uh, punishment to myself as I was flying from the East Coast to the West Coast I was watching Sean Hannity for two hours, um, and I thought I'd go out of my mind. And then I decided that I needed to watch CNN, and it was also hyper um, in terms of hyping the same story over and over again. And I think the press is not doing the job it should. I do believe in newspapers, um, and I think that, but the hard part is how do people really find out what is the truth, and therefore, I think one has to read a lot of different kinds of sources and figure out what is going on. But I think to demonize the press is crazy, um, and it's the communists who actually first talked about the press being the enemy of the people. Um, and and uh, there, there may be fake news, there are not fake facts or alternative facts. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very important to try to figure out uh, and you need to read and listen to different things and then compile. At a university, people understand that when you do research, you look at a lot of different sources um, in order to, uh, although they're in books and you can figure out who wrote them um, and, they're, and, and when they were published, it's a little harder in terms of the social media and the things that we are being bombarded with and the algorithms about who reads what and why. So I think we're in a very complicated period. I want to thank Secretary Albright who came and taught my class, yeah. our class today on this issue, because yeah. I have a class, I see some people in the yeah. front row nodding, on the effects of the digital revolution yeah. on our society. And we had a very deep discussion of this, so thank you. Yeah. And um, you're going to the Munich Security Conference in a few days. And they're going to talk about social media, which is now a security issue. Do you think it would be possible to have a sort of an accord that said social media has to take responsibility for what's on the platform and it can't just be all anonymous? And if you're a Facebook or a Twitter or a Google even, you have some responsibility, just as when you are married to a newspaper man, you know, the newspaper has responsibility. Yeah. No, I think that we need it. Um, and the thing I compare it more to was the beginning of arms control agreements, right. when people didn't quite know what the rules of the road were supposed to be. Um, and there was a whole priesthood, actually, that began to think about uh, mm -hmm. how one counted missiles and what one did and mutually assured destruction, all the various parts. I do think that we need to do something about the social media. The problem is, and I have spent time in Brussels with the faceless bureaucrats, um, that basically um, there is a real difference about how Europeans see privacy and how Americans see privacy. And so there are real questions about how that works, but I do think it's almost as if there should be some kind of a convention on appropriate behavior, the anonymity of various aspects, the responsibility, uh, but it requires um, not kind of some edict from above. It requires, first of all, people that actually understand things. Uh, I found very peculiar the um, 
uh, Senate hearing of Zuckerberg, uh, mm -hmm. where they didn't kind of even know what questions to ask. So um, I, I do think there needs to be some way of understanding it and then having a participatory convention aspect of it to, to develop some rules, but it's not gonna be easy. And then you add to that the cyber attacks um, and, and how that works um, and how I, I do believe the Russians have weaponized information. Um, and that, um, by the way, I don't think we can forget Putin is a KGB agent. He knows a lot about propaganda and he has played a weak hand brilliantly. Um, he, has, um, he has a strategy. He doesn't uh, just say things. And <clears throat> what he has tried to do is to, and is working on separating for us from our allies. And he has now made friends with Viktor Orban on illiberal democracy. Uh, and so I think we are not um, vigilant enough about the weaponization of information. You mentioned North Korea. You're actually somebody who's been there and was sent there. Um, I have one simple question. You've met the dear leader. Who's taller, you or the dear leader? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I met, I met the dear leader's father. Right. We are, by the way, when I went there, uh, I, I went there kind of late fall 2000. Um, and can I, I'd like sure. to give some background on it. We had spent in the Clinton administration by the way, the younger people here, uh, when I talk about Clinton in my class, it's like talking about Napoleon or something. Uh, but, um, we won't go there. The, anyway, uh, but we had spent a lot of time on dealing with North Korea throughout the administration in terms of trying to deal with this uh, Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il. And kind of in the late summer of 2000, um, the number two guy came to the United States and we were in the Oval Office and he gave President Clinton a red folder, and in it was an invitation for President Clinton to come. And he said, well, maybe at some point, but I need to get the Secretary of State to prepare this. They were not real happy about that. We have no embassy in Pyongyang. We have no, it's very hard to figure out what's really going on. So um, I did call Kim Dae-jung, the president of South Korea, who had dealt with Kim Jong-il, and he said, you know, he's intelligent, you can deal with him. Then I got the information from our intelligence agencies that said he's crazy and a pervert. Mm -hmm. So um, when I get there, I am stuck in the guest house um, waiting for instructions about what to do. And all of a sudden I get an instruction saying that I had to go and see his uh, embalmed father. So I went to the mausoleum, very complicated because if you bow too low, uh, <laughs> then um, what happens is the press traveling with you says you're being obsequious. If you don't bow low enough, then you haven't accomplished anything. So I must have had the right angle because when I get back to the guest house, they say, the dear leader will see you. So we had a press conference and um, very, you know, something out of the 50s, but I'm standing next to him and I notice we're the same height. And I had on high heels, and then I looked, and so did he. Uh, <clears throat> and his hair was a lot poofier than mine. Um, but he was, then we had meetings, and he really was very smart in terms of the technical aspects of missile limits and a number of different um, aspects to that whole meeting. Um, and um, what is too bad, I think that um, some Americans were confused by the election of 2000. Um, when I was there was when it was decided that uh, President Bush had won, and I went uh, to brief Secretary Powell on what we had done, and the he, incoming the secretary. incoming secretary, and he uh, was willing to go on, and then there was a headline in the Washington Post that said, um, that Powell to continue Clinton policies on North Korea. He was hauled into the Oval Office and told no way. So the bottom line is I hold no brief for the North Koreans, but we've kind of gone back and forth on things. The one thing that I truly do take full responsibility for is Dennis Rodman. <laughs> uh, uh, and what happened was they did tell me that Kim Jong-il liked basketball. So I took um, a, a basketball autograph by Michael Jordan to give him, and they have it in their Holy of Holies. So I think they see basketball <laughs> players as a, a diplomatic vehicle. Is the Trump administration right 
to re-engage? Um, I think absolutely. I think it's better than um, fire and fury and trying to figure out who has the bigger button. So um, the Im important part was, I think, by the way, I do believe in diplomacy. However, you need diplomats to do diplomacy. And so, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and there requires there to be some preparation. So the question is, what was done before the Singapore summit? And I have been asked whether it was a win-win or a Kim-win. It was a Kim-win, because what happened was President Trump uh, canceled the uh, military exercises that we have had regularly with the Japanese and the South Koreans without consulting them, and it was something that he gave um, Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-il said that he would denuclearize, but there has been no definition of what that means. What are the steps? What would be the verification? So President Reagan was right, trust but verify. So you need some kind of verification. Um, they are going to meet again uh, later, I guess in about 10 days, in Vietnam. What is good is that Secretary Pompeo has had some um, meetings, and now there's a man called Steve Began, uh, who is a special, whom we know, who's a special envoy trying to sort things out. So I do think there will be more preparation. But the question is still there. What are the steps? What, um, because we have sanctions on North Korea. The North Koreans want them removed without really having done anything yet. The South Koreans have be been very involved in it. I think the North Koreans are dangerous. Um, there was a, an article today, actually, um, by one of the great experts um, in, at Stanford who said that he thought that they were still doing things in, on highly enriched uranium and that they had the possibility of making, I think, there's something like 20 nuclear weapons. And they do have the capability, they have not tested um, missiles recently, uh, but they do have that capability. And so we can't just kind of have, uh, you know, nice uh, flattering uh, conversations. Um, summits are very important, but they have to be prepared, and there has to be very clear what comes out of them. We were attacked by North Korea. They attacked us with a cyber attack that blew yeah, up right. both the Sony lot and many other things and a lot of leaks. Had they sent a missile that hit Los Angeles, as Secretary of State, when you got into the Situation Room, you'd know what you'd recommend. Yeah, right. You'd retaliate. Yeah. Why didn't we retaliate by shutting down everything, all electricity in North Korea for a week? Well, I, the answer is I don't know. I mean, this happened some time ago, but I think that um, I think we keep trying to find some way to deal with them. I don't think we fully, I don't think the U.S. has fully gotten on board cyber. We know how to defend. Do we know at this moment how to be more aggressive with cyber? Should we have an offensive I, cyber well, capability? I, I actually think we should. Um, it is, but I think it then also requires all kinds of new rules of the road. I mean, according to all I do now, I mean, I am not, I read the newspapers or listen, and, but we clearly did something in Iran with Stuxnet. Um, right. And so we do have some ways that we know how to do that. I do think we need to keep up with what's going on. What troubles me is we are also doing something that is very dangerous, is upping our whole nuclear um, arsenal mm -hmm. and um, looking at new kinds of weapons when, in fact, we should be trying to figure out to go back to how uh, arms control agreements are done. The fact that we have pulled out of the INF Treaty on intermediate weapons is stupid. Um, that's a diplomatic term of art. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I think also uh, the, new, the New START Treaty is coming up for negotiation. And one of the things I, I was asked in your class, actually, in terms of uh, what happens when there are not enough diplomats. What, uh, the, the truth is that there was this whole um, arms control priesthood that has kind of dissipated, um, and I think we need experts that are able to deal with this that have the competence of the president in terms of what negotiations are complicated, and they require um, people who understand it. It's also useful after a meeting to know what happened in the meeting. 
Um, somebody, Is that sort of really weird that he had meetings with Putin in which we didn't have note takers? Totally weird. Has that ever happened before? Well, I think the thing to be, what does happen is there are short meetings that happen between leaders, but normally if that happens, then the leader comes out and says exactly what happened. But on the whole, if you're going to have an important meeting, you need to have a note taker in it. I think the thing that's unfair is when they're saying that the interpreter should turn over his or her notes. Let me just say, I don't think people fully understand the role of the interpreter. It is essential in, a, in any diplomatic negotiation. And even if you know the language, I mean, I, I used to love to go to Russia, and I would be talking to Yeltsin, and there was a delegation, and he'd say, stop translating, she understands Russian. And I said, don't stop. I mean, the rest of the delegation needs to understand it, plus it gives you time to think. But what happens is that um, the, the interpreter is not a stenographer. And if you've ever seen interpreter's notes, they're a bunch of chicken scratches mm -hmm. and things that are something that prompts them to remember what they've said. It's an incredibly difficult job. Um, and so it's unfair when there are issues about, you know, uh, subpoenaing those roles. But what is crazy is that we do not have uh, notes on what, had, what was done at Helsinki and various places. And there clearly is a different interpretation that Putin has of what happened, and we don't really know what happened. Uh, I want to open it up to questions. There's microphones in the aisles. Come up to them, if you would. Well, somebody I was about to say, and I'll ask a question while waiting. But this is not a shy crowd, so I won't ask <laughs> yeah, a question. Yeah. Go for it. Thank you so much for putting this show on for us. Oh my god, look at the number of Wow. Goodness. If I had known, I would have <laughs> saved myself the effort of asking questions. Hey. Uh, my question is, what do we in this audience do? We see the same dangers that you have enumerated in your book. I vote. I call my representative, give them hell on the phone. I talk <laughs> to my senators. I talk with other people. And I'm extremely frustrated with the way things are happening in the United States right now. I travel internationally and nationally. And to, to have my country denigrated the way it is in South America and in Europe just drives me crazy. So, so you have a see something, do? say something. Well, and I mean, my, we do have the see something, say something. I've had it to that do something, that we cannot normalize what is going on. Um, and um, so my list, and, and I think everybody should add to it, is first of all that we, and this goes to the role of the press, we have to call it out. We cannot um, say that the press is the enemy of the people. It is the basis of democracy. We also do have to make clear that we understand what the institutional structure is. Um, I'm very glad you call your members of Congress, but we have to also um, really make clear that the way that we operate, uh, we need to respect the judiciary. I think some of the statements that have been made um, when President Trump said that, that a uh, judge that was of Mexican origin couldn't make uh, determinations, or, um, I mean, the Supreme Court is going in a particular direction, unfortunately. Um, but I think the kind of thing that's happening in the state courts and the lower courts and the kind of way that, that they are put down is appalling. Uh, and then I also do think that it's important to say that we cannot have our officials think they're above the law. Then uh, I have advocated, um, and you validated, is that people either need to run for office or support the people that are, and it takes active work. And I have to say, I am really glad that the presidential campaign has begun already, that, mm -hmm. because there are so many things to talk about, um, and I think we need to hear them, and we need to hear what people um, think about uh, how to solve the various problems that we raised. It's no secret I'm a Democrat. So what I hope is that we don't form our firing line in a circle uh, <laughs> and that we end up with a very strong candidate um, who can do this. Then, oh, okay. uh, uh, 
a couple of other things. One is this idea that you have to talk to people with whom you disagree. Tolerance is not the right word. Respect is, and we need to find out why good people decided to vote the way they are. Then there has not um, been a book or a speech that's ever been given that doesn't quote Robert Frost. So um, <laughs> Robert Frost, uh, there's a quote I like, which is, the older I get, the younger are my teachers. Um, and it really is something, it happens to be the anniversary of Parkland. Uh, and those young people, and by the way, Olivia just gave this to me uh, in honor of uh, the young people in Parkland, is that they went out and marched and are doing things, and I think we need to uh, support the young people. And as a professor, I really do think that our students are the ones now um, that are community-oriented, that want to do something, and I think we need to be supportive. So that's my to-do list, but I think we have to do. Yeah. 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 Um, good evening. Um, I'm a high school student, and I was just wondering what advice you have for um, young women like me who want to work in politics. Well, very good. And my advice is go do it. Um, and, um, and I think really be involved. And, but I think the important part is to get informed about what the issues are. Um, and really talk about them and get your friends to do it with you. And then, I have to tell you this, be prepared to sometimes be disappointed, um, and that it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it again and again. And think about what you can, can do. You have a voice, um, and um, voting is very important, but also activity and doing it with others. When my daughter was, our daughter was in high school, she asked the same question of Secretary Albright, which is also in the last chapter of her book, Madam yeah. Secretary. And the advice you gave was, if you're a woman, learn to interrupt. Yeah. I have never fully <laughs> forgiven you because my daughter me. has learned that. No, I remember that so well. And you and Kathy said, what did you teach her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'll be happy to know she has interrupted people ever since. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Madam Secretary. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here. Um, I don't know how to phrase this as a question. I think it may end up coming out more as a statement, mm -hmm. but that would be unfortunate because I do want your opinion of the matter and not just make statements mm -hmm. of my own. Jobs are very important to certain people in this country. We define ourselves by what we do. People ask you where you're from, but they also ask you what you do. And when they ask what they do, it's not about your hobby that we're discussing. It's about what you're paid by our society to perform. The economics of our society is very important to many people. Mm -hmm. Lots of people don't have jobs, first of all. Second of all, many people who do have jobs prefer not to be defined by them. Um, do you have any comments at all about the way for us to change our job distribution in the following hypothetical manner? When I was in Philadelphia, in order to get hired as a nurse, you had to agree to o a mandatory overtime. <coughs> We would not hire you five years ago in Philadelphia unless you agreed to 55 hours a week. I, we do have a whole lot of people lined up. So I think it's a good point you made, and let no, me let I'm, the secretary well, Let me just respond. say, I do think that we are operating kind of in, in the wrong century on a lot of this, not understanding what the jobs are. The fact that uh, we need to train people for a different kind of job. Um, that there does need to be some distribution of them. And by the way, somebody that I really admired was President Václav Havel of, uh, of the Czech Republic, who said that people need to have the dignity of knowing that something they produced made a difference. And I think there isn't so much what you do, but the dignity that a job brings. And I do think we need to figure out how to operate in the 21st century about how much time what the various recompenses for it, because it does, um, it does determine how you feel about yourself and therefore how people feel about you. Yes, Mussolini was pronatalist and restricted women's reproductive rights, and I was wondering if you could talk about the role of misogyny in fascism and also the role of the current president in inflaming um, anger against women's changing roles in women's rights and how much you see that as a backlash against what we've already achieved. Um, well, first of all, um, you notice that 
there are no fascist women leaders. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, um, I also do think that we need to believe what women say. Believe the women. Um, and, and, but I think it is, it's very hard. There's no question in terms of, I think uh, <clears throat> the, the reproductive rights are not only just about, um, it's about res allowing women to be able to make decisions about our own lives and not being told what to do with our bodies. So I do think it is very important. I think that there is nothing about this president that would indicate that he understands that. Um, and so I'm very troubled by that in every single way. Um, and I think it's part of the to-do list is that we have to talk about it and we have to believe the women, we have to believe each other, we have to support each other. The most famous thing I ever said was that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. I think we can't be judgmental about each other. So, um, but I think it's a major issue and it's obviously coming up all the time and it will again in the Supreme Court. And I think we have to make clear where we stand on it. Stefan, one of my students. Hello, Madam Secretary. Thank you for coming to Tulane. Um, my question is very similar to hers, um, but I would like you to tilt it uh, more towards the younger audience here. Um, as a college student, first of all, a lot of us look up to you, um, so thanks. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, we feel so encumbered by our studies or whatever we're doing um, that we often feel powerless. Um, but I know that you're opinion is probably different. Um, <laughs> so with that in mind, um, can you answer to the university students who are here, how the hell do we save the world? <laughs> but, but before you answer, let me just say something that will embarrass Stefan Suazo, who is a student of mine. Last semester, while taking my course, which is an easy course, so it wasn't that hard, he ran for office and ran for school board in Jefferson Parish. And even though he didn't win, your ability to get into the arena yeah. impresses me. Um, and, and you were I, right, I am embarrassed. Well, I was you. going to say that it's important to get out there and participate. And what I've been so impressed with this generation is basically the community activity and really getting involved. The truth is, as a professor, I can't say that you're encumbered by your studies. Um, but I think that it is important, uh, you have a lot of energy. By the way, you can't look up to me because you're too tall. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that what has to happen is to make um, the political activity a part of your life. And whether you do it in a college environment or out in the, uh, the counties that you live in, I think it is very Im important. Um, you know, uh, the millennials have wondered what they should do. I'm a perennial. Uh, and so um, I think that what we have to do is each generation, we need to respect each other and work together on a number of different issues. And I, I really do think, just flat out, my generation helped to screw things up and you guys have to get out there and find some answers and I think we need to work with you. But I think, go for it. Right. Thanks. Uh, yes, so, uh Continuing along the theme of college, uh, I'm in college and I'm looking to, I, I'd very much like to work for the government, but uh, seeing what the uh, current administration is doing is very uh, disheartening. And I was wondering if you had any advice to, I guess, anyone who uh, is looking to work in, uh, work a, I guess, a bureaucratic position in the government and who doesn't know if they should, seeing that uh, at any time what they're working for can be overturned by a president who doesn't share their values. Well, let me just say, I have to say, the thing that I enjoyed most in my life being was being a public servant. Um, I think it is, in a democracy, a very important job to have. I worked on Capitol Hill, and I worked in the White House, and then I had another job. And so, um, but basically, I think it is very important to think about the work in the government and especially going into it, because I know I've been asked questions about diplomats, and, um, and I teach at Georgetown, and there have been some of my students that wondered whether they should take the Foreign Service exam and go into it. And I say, absolutely. Uh, first of all, it's endlessly fascinating, um, 
And even though there are hiring freezes and all kinds of problems, um, it is important to go in, especially, I think, the, you, at your age, you may think you don't want to be involved in the policy. The bottom line is if you're at the State Department, you'll be stamping visas. You will not be doing policy. <laughs> but you will be in the pipeline of being able to uh, end up serving your country and being very proud of it. And I hope people don't, because if you don't go into the government and then it's run by a bunch of people that don't have a clue or don't care or um, uh, somehow are compromised, then we're not going to get back in order to have a government that serves the people. And so, yes, I think people need to go into the government. On a lighter note, Madam Secretary, in your autobiography, Madam Secretary, the vignette that stays with me the longest is the episode of the salad dressing on your <laughs> skirt. Would you care to comment about that one? And you can talk about the hot hat. Yeah, no. <laughs> so I'll tell you the thing that there are very strange things about having been the first woman Secretary of State. I had started out, actually, I wasn't the first woman to represent the U.S. at the U.N., um, Jean Kirkpatrick was. Um, and I met with her before I went to New York. And she, she, not to insult the professors here, but since I was one and so was she, said, she said, get rid of your professor clothes um, and get more elegant clothes, which was a great uh, chance to shop. So, um, <laughs> but it is not simple because you're criticized about everything. Um, and so, you know, is your skirt too short or too long or the wrong color or whatever? Um, and uh, Condi Rice was criticized but for wearing boots to something. Um, so, you know, they don't do that to men. My issue was the following. It was I was at a conference in Paris and talking to a foreign minister and um, spilled salad dressing on my skirt. And so all of a sudden somebody came up and said, we're going to do a picture of all the foreign ministers. And I thought, oh, my God, I've got salad dressing. What am I going to do? So I tried to figure out if my skirt was loose enough to turn around. Um, and fortunately, it was not one of those with a slit up the back. And I was able to turn my skirt around. And I thought Henry Kissinger couldn't do that. So <laughs> there are some advantages. <laughs> Secretary Albright, thank you for your time. So my question is, there have been many people who have drawn parallels between fascism and the current administration's attack on the press as well as their um, divisiveness. And so that being said, do you think that America is ever at risk of succumbing to a fascist regime? I, I, I am, the reason I wrote this is that I am concerned. And so people ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And so partially because I had seen and I continue to see the feather plucking going on that I think we need to know what's going on and to call it and especially, and as I said earlier, not to normalize this in any way. So, um, and I, I actually um, met with a lot of my students to see how they defined fascism and were they concerned that something might happen. And people are concerned. And therefore, I think that laying it out there and trying to answer your questions and thinking about how much activity um, all of you need to do, the to-do list, and add to the to-do list. So yes, I'm concerned. Uh, I do, I've been asked whether I think that Donald Trump is a fascist. I don't call him a fascist. I say that he's the least democratic president that we've had in modern American history, and that we need to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, thank you for coming. Uh, at the risk of sounding uh, a little too academic and also um, the way I word this, I'll do my best. Um, I've read before about um, you know, various books uh, about the anatomy of fascism. There's actually one by Robert O. Paxton, um, Anatomy of Fascism. Um, and one of the things that, themes that still kind of seems to keep coming up is, um, especially with Hitler and Mussolini, is conservatives in power. Um, and I don't, and not necessarily ideologically, but European conservatives at the time, like von Hindenburg, um, and who was in power with uh, Hitler in Italy. Um, my question is, uh, 
do you see that, do you see that, drawing on the thing of parallels, do you see that a similar thing happening with certain people in power, especially with like people in the Republican Party who are suddenly very much like, they love Putin and they, they seem to have this, you know, fascination with um, more authoritarian regimes of our president as well. Um, do you see that happening here? Well, let me just say the following thing, is that democracy is messy, there's no question. And it also takes a while to get it. So one of the things, just to go back on something, as I've mentioned, um, um, I am chairman of the Democratic Institute, and we've been in a number of different countries. And one of the things that I've talked about a lot is what happened with the Arab Spring. And an example of things that happen is through social media, people were motivated to go to Tahrir Square. Um, and then they got there, they didn't know quite what to do. Elections were held too soon. The Muslim Brotherhood was organized and they won. And Tahrir Square, the people did not get what they wanted. Meanwhile, I kind of made up an older guy that um, needed to get into Cairo to open his stall in the marketplace. And he says, screw this, I need to um, order. And all of a sudden, you have Sisi. Uh, and I think that is part of what has happened. Democracy is complicated in that way. I'm sure that all of you that study, there's always this discussion about what comes first, economic development or political development. They go together because people want to vote and eat. And so there has to be a figured out how to do that. By the way, I have to tell you, the National Democratic Institute decided to give our Democracy Award to Jose Andreas this year because he made it possible for people to eat. Uh, but I, I think that that's a question about that it takes a long time, that people don't understand their responsibility, and so then they do turn to an authoritarian leader. And just as I think that illiberal democracy is an oxymoron, the other thing that is, sounds like an oxymoron is what the Chinese are talking about authoritarian capitalism. So there's this confusion about what goes where, um, and I think we need to sort out that I happen to think we all are the same and people want to be able to make decisions about their own lives, but it takes uh, responsibility and public action. Um, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Um, you talked earlier about cybersecurity and that the U.S. needs to be more on the offense rather than the defense. What do you think, you know, if you were still um, Secretary of State acting now, what do you think you would place at the forefront of our offensive actions? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say more. I think we need defense as well as offense, not that we need more offense than defense. I'm not an expert on this, but I do think that there needs to be some way to figure out uh, if some country or non-state um, non actor is trying to undermine our entire system, do we have enough intelligence ahead of time in order to be able to stop it and mitigate it um, and try to figure out um, you know, how we are not the last country to deal with um, artificial intelligence and things. So I do think that there needs to be more research on a lot of aspects of cyber um, um, security in a number of ways. But I would not say we need more offense than defense. Um, it, it, we need both. And we need to do, um, uh, you know, exp trying to get, put money into it and try to get experts to help us figure it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Madam Secretary, what are your thoughts about Iran? About what? Iran. Iran. Well, um, one of the things that I think is, uh, when I teach, I often talk about the unintended consequences of decisions. And Iran is a perfect example. Um, Walter, you earlier today talked about Einstein and splitting the atom, and so I take the whole issue of Iran all the way to us dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I don't know whether physicists felt guilty that they had done that, but they go to President Eisenhower and say there are peaceful uses of nuclear energy. He then gives a speech called Atoms for Peace in 1953, um, and it was the basis of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the IAEA. Iran, that was under the Shah at the time, is a signatory of it. The United States sold them the technology. Um, and I think it's just an example of trying to figure out what the intentions are. I think that I was in the White House during the Iran hostage crisis. 
um, and I have watched what's gone on with Iran. We do not have relations. And by the way, another story about when Khatami was elected, uh, the Clinton administration, we tried to figure out uh, how to change our relationships with Iran. Um, and I had a meeting in the uh, United Nations with the person that had been, I thought, the perm rep and then became the foreign minister. I won't go through the whole story. But our, um, we didn't know who he was. I asked our entire um, bench of Iran experts whether this was Karazi, and they didn't know. So our lack of information about what's going on there, I think, is a problem. I think the JCPOA was a good agreement and worth doing. I think pulling out of it has undermined how we deal with our, uh, the other people involved in it, our reputation in terms of multilateral diplomacy, uh, and makes it very hard to have a Korean nuclear agreement because uh, why would anybody trust us? I am very worried, however, about Iran and what it is doing in the Middle East um, and sponsoring terrorism. Um, and I don't think we have a policy that deals with it. I know there are a lot of other questions. Secretary Albright is, or Professor Albright, I'll elevate yeah, your that, title, yeah. um, <laughs> is going to stay for another 45 minutes or so out there for those who buy books and yeah. the talk. But I want to end, before I give you a pen, which yeah. is part of the whole process here, I want to end by saying you say you're an optimist who worries. A lot of what you said today, I understand why you're worried. Tell me what gives you optimism. Uh, my optimism is that I believe um, in the resiliency of democracy um, and in this country. And I am so grateful to be an American. And, and I don't like it, um, as well, the first questioner said, how we're being viewed now. We are not a victim. We are the most powerful country in the world. We are the most generous country in the world. And we are the indispensable nation. And there's nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. Uh, it means that we need to be engaged, and that's what I'm optimistic about. And again, I'll refer to my father when we came, and he said there is nothing better than being a professor in a free country. But he also said that he was worried that Americans took democracy for granted. But just listening to the questions and the desire for some answers, I think we've had it. I think we want to do something, um, and that's what, why I'm an optimist.